Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Risk, Senior Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator for today. The title of today's webinar is Accelerating Crop Research with High Quality Affordable Genome Assemblies, and our sponsors are Illumina and Energene. Our panelists today are Dr. Asaf Distelfeld, Professor at Tel Aviv University, Guy Cole, Vice President of R&D and Products at Energene, Khalil Lawless, Agrigenomic Segment Manager for the Americas at Illumina, and Dr. Alvaro Hernandez, Director of DNA Services at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar screen. If you look to the tray at the bottom of your window, you'll see a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Cole. Please go ahead. Thank you all for joining us today. In this webinar, we will discuss and show you how you can accelerate your research with high-quality, affordable genome assemblies. We will start with Professor Asaf Distelfeld, a leading wheat researcher from Tel Aviv University, who will present his research and explain how he used the Novo assemblies in practice in the relevant wheat genome to accelerate his research. Next, I will be speaking on the actual de novo assembly technology and how do we actually allow Asaf to get high quality data and we can do that for other researchers in the future. After that, we'll have Dr. Khalil Lawless, the Agrigenomic Segment Manager in the Americas in Illumina, who will present Illumina new NovoSec technology and their activity in agriculture. And lastly, we'll have Dr. Alvaro, who will present the behind the scene library preparation for the Illumina libraries. Asaf, please begin. Thank you, Guy. Hello, everyone. I'm a wheat geneticist from Tel Aviv University. I established my lab about uh, nine years ago, and my lab seeks to explore wheat genetic diversity, including wild relatives of wheat, for wheat improvement. In this talk, we will go back in time, more than 10,000 years ago, to discuss wheat domestication. This study that I will present benefited from using the most advanced genomic tools. Uh, one of the aims of this talk is to present these resources and explain how anyone can benefit from using them for their own studies. So, why to study wheat domestication? The idea is that if you wish to improve something, and of course we all uh, wish to improve wheat, it is very beneficial to know what was already improved and how. Um, following this idea, our crop history is not only interesting, but also has implications on breeding, because when we better understand the evolution, what happened in the past, we may be able to better design future crops. Now, a few words about uh, wheat evolution. Most of uh, what we call wheat is polyploid, meaning that it contains more than one genome that hybridized and created new species. The central polyploidization event in wheat occurred half a million years ago, when a diploid genome of Triticum urartu the donor of the A genome, hybridized with the diploid species related to Echilops peltoides, which is the donor of the B genome. This was accompanied by spontaneous chromosome doubling, which gave rise to Triticum dicocoides, known as wild emmer wheat. As you can see in the map in the right, wild emmer wheat grows naturally in the Fertile Crescent in scattered locations. As you can understand, wheat domestication and evolution under domestication had a huge impact because it allowed wheat to spread from this relatively narrow region to the whole world, and by that, greatly affecting our culture. These slides uh, represent, um, helps us to imagine how it was before wheat was domesticated. Here is a naturally grown wild emmer wheat field in one of the nature reserves in Israel. Wild wheat, as all wild plants, is capable of taking care of itself, and the main mechanism for doing so is the mechanism of spike shattering that allowed wild emmer wheat to distribute its seeds, meaning that in two weeks' time, from the picture that you see in front of you, all those wonderful spikes that you can see will be disassembled to spikelets and be on the ground or actually digging into the ground to be ready to germinate on the next growing season. So you can imagine prehistoric humans, probably prehistoric women, 
harvesting or gathering wild emerald wheat and use it for their, own, for their nutrition. At some point, humans started cultivating it and selected plants which were better adapted for their needs. This selection process driven the evolution of wheat and caused for phenotypic changes that are collective, collectively called as domestication syndrome. Domestication syndrome changes are mainly related to modification in plant architecture, spike morphology, germination ability, ability or the loss of seed dormancy, and grain size. So we can ask when uh, was wheat domesticated? So the first domesticated wheat, called emmer wheat, was evolved more than 10,000 years ago. And we know this from archaeological uh, sites from the Fertile Crescents. The hallmark of wheat domestication, or the most prominent change, was the transition from shattered spike to non-shattered spikes, also called non-brittle spikes. The result of this change is that domesticated wheat spikes remain intact. We can call it also non-brittle spikes, and this enable easier harvest. Let's go back and talk about wheat evolution after wheat domestication. Because we know that after domestication, another polypolarization event took place with the hybridization of emmer wheat and Tausch gold grass and formed hexaploid wheat, which uh, the common name is bread wheat. And bread wheat is probably the most widely grown plant on our planet. We know that there are many wheat varieties and also that it has complex evolution. So the question is, was wheat domesticated only once? To answer this, we wanted first to identify the molecular mechanism controlling the non-shattered spikes of wheat and to find out if the same mechanism existed in all genotypes. Our approach was to perform genetic mapping study. To do so, we selected two representatives of wild and domesticated wheat. We then selected a durum wheat cultivar named Svevo. Svevo is an Italian durum wheat developed for, uh, by Barilla and considered to produce high quality pasta. We crossed Svevo with wild emerald wheat collected in Zavitan Nature Reserve in northern Israel. After we crossed uh, those two parental lines, we created a mapping population of recombinant inbred lines. Um, and this uh, mapping population was used to map domestication syndrome traits. And in the picture, you can see the segregation, for example, sh spike shattering in this population. Um, it is not just uh, shattered spikes versus not shattered spikes, because you can see uh, degrees of uh, shattering. Therefore, we gave a numeric value for the degree of shattering and did a quantitative trait locus analysis, or QTL analysis for short. The population was genotyped with Illumina's Infinium assay, and we uh, constructed a very dense genetic map. We combined the genetic map with the phenotypic data, and this allowed us to, to uh, perform the QTL analysis and identify, like you can see in the table, five low size that con control spike shattering with the two main uh, loci on uh, chromosome 3A and 3B. Uh, these loci, and here I show uh, one loci locus on chromosome 3B, overlapped with previously reported QTLs for spike shattering in wheat. So we were pretty confident about our genetic mapping results. Uh, in addition, in Bali, in the orthologous chromosome 3H uh, was also shown to harbor shattering genes. And a major breakthrough was published in 2015 after many years of research. The group of Takao Komatsuda from Japan identified two genes named BTR1 and BTR2, which are responsible for the brittle rachis or the non shattering spike trait of domesticated barley. But even uh, with these candidate genes, we had difficulties to move forward in wheat and learn about those, those genes. 
Fortunately, using Illumina's NGS sequencing and Energen's de novo magic technology, we were able to assemble the reference genomes of both the Vitan and Svevo, which are the parental lines of our mapping population. These, these were two major projects required many resources. I'm, I'm not going to describe those uh, projects. Um, but l let me just mention that today we have the ability to sequence large and complex genomes using smaller resources and funds, as will be discussed uh, later. These uh, investments in the genome assemblies paid off because uh, for the first time, we had a sequence of a DNA molecule that covered a complete QTL region, or in this case, uh, regions of the BTR1 uh, regions on chromosome 3A and 3B. And this allowed us to quickly and easily identify the autologous BTR1 and BTR2 in wheat. And you can see in the, in the image, those are the, the, um, those genes that are located in the middle of the, of the QTL region using our mapping uh, data from the Svevo Zavitan population. And this slide demonstrates why we need genome assemblies in order to answer all the questions to the highest levels. Because you can see that there are several duplicates for the BTR1 and BTR2 genes on chromosome 3B. Now, considering the fact that that a similar complexity exists also on chromosome 3A, it is not a surprise that we had difficulties to study these genes without a high quality reference genome. Because without knowing the, the sequence of those genes and the region, we couldn't even uh, design a specific primers to amplify those genes by a, a normal PCR. So to, to summarize our finding, this uh, slide summarizes our finding here. By comparing all the genes from the Svevo and Zavitan in the BTR region, we were able to identify two causative mutations that are responsible for the non-shattered spikes of durum wheat Svevo. The mechanism for non-shattering spikes in wheat includes only mutation in the BTR genes, in the BTR1 genes, and not the BTR2 genes as described in barley. These mutations are causing the protein responsible for spike shattering to become non-functional, hence the non-functional, the non-shattered spikes. But is this mechanism is true only for Svevo, or is it a general mechanism that exists in all domesticated wheat varieties? So in order to answer this question, we needed, we needed to sequence and assemble many genomes and to be able to compare the, the sequence in those uh, loci. Fortunately, there is an advanced wheat pangenome uh, initiative, this initiative called the 10 Plus Genome Project, and it is led by Professor Curtis Posniak from the University of Saskatchewan. And this uh, initiative produced several high quality wheat assemblies. The data from these assemblies are publicly available and we used uh, this data to compare the sequences of the BTR1 genes in all uh, domesticated wheat genotypes that were sequenced. The results show that all the genotypes in the wheat pan genome had identical haplotypes for the BTR1 genes on chromosomes 3A and 3B. This means that a common mechanism is responsible for the non-shattering spikes in wheat and suggesting that wheat was domesticated only once in our history. Now, let's assume that we have a wheat genotype in our own, own lab with an interesting phenotype that can, be, that can be resistant to fungal disease, maybe drought tolerance, or even a, a trait related to grain quality. You, you name it. However, this genotype is unsequenced. So how can we move forward and fast and easy in this situation? So until recently, one genome sequence was very expensive to achieve. And therefore, we had to, to form a large consortium of a uh, few laboratories, laboratories around the world in order to sequence that genome. However, however with the Energin's new uh, solution called the Novomax, and Guy will talk about it uh, later, 
we can now sequence and assemble genomes at a lower price. Um, so we tested uh, the de novo max ability to assemble two-wheat genomes, as you can see from this slide. And those genomes are marked as wheat one and wheat two. And we compared them to the previously existed assemblies by the, that were assembled in the large consortium, also produced by Energin. And those are the sequence of, uh, sequences of uh, Chinese spring and Zavitan, which is the wild emmer wheat. And you can see that the quality is, uh, the, quality is the same. Um, so as you can see, the, the, this would enable us to replicate the same results by uh, detecting the causative BTR1 mutations and actually solve the, the biological question that's, that was in the, the base of our, uh, our study. So to summarize, Understanding the genetic diversity is greatly assisted by having high quality and continuous genome assemblies. The de novo max assembly is an efficient and practical way to obtain genome assembly and allow us to bridge the gap between genotype and, and its phenotype. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions later, but now let's move to Guy Cole, one of Energin's founders and the VP product, that will present the new De De Novo solution. Thank you, Asaf. So uh, we have just heard a use case from Asaf around the demonstration of how do you use a high quality reference genome to accelerate gene mapping. This kind of a uh, use case is just one of the applications that one can imagine using g genome assemblies. Additional ones include QTL analysis, genome selection, and others that are critical for agri-genomics research. Energy Vision is to empower agriculture application by providing them cutting-edge genomic algorithms. In this presentation, I will describe the new products and enable you to understand the difference between uh, the de novo uh, technology as we used to have and the one that are just been uh, developed. So what is energy in de novo assembly service? It's basically a full service that starts with DNA extraction. Then DNA libraries are prepared from the DNA and Alvaro will touch on that point later on. Then sequencing of a specific recipe of libraries and coverages is actually done. And you can see the libraries and coverages for the de novo magic application listed on the screen. And so that specific set of libraries and coverages is tightly coupled with an algorithm that then can assemble very complex genome into very high quality uh, genome assemblies. And those assemblies are sent to the customers as at the end of the service. What is the difference between this uh, assembly and the new de novo max assembly that uh, Asaf just uh, mentioned? Well, it's all about the ability to use less libraries and less coverage in each library and get still very high quality results. We've found out that for specific uh, genomes, we can reduce the uh, coverage by almost a half and actually uh, give back some of the libraries and still get very high quality results. That's uh, the meaning of this change is actually a dramatic reduce in price for those specific homozygote genomes in this case that can go through this process. And so what you would want to do is actually uh, look at the option of for a specific genome you're interested in. If it's a homozygote genome, we can probably assemble that genome in a much reduced price without hurting not the quality and the time that this service is delivered. Of course, the other parameter that actually helped this reduction was to move uh, some of the sequence to the new Novosec 6000 machine from Illumina, who actually uh, delivers a high quality data, again, in a reduced price. So just to summarize, you, you, it's a full service, it's accurate, and it's fast. 
and uh, at very competitive prices nowadays. So right now, this opens up the opportunity for researchers to have all the genomes that they really need for their research. What are the de novo max actually producing? Okay, so what you can see here is that the, the, the de novo max outcomes for different genomes in different organisms, this is just a sample or a selection of random genomes we were able to assemble before today's uh, presentation, but there's a lot more done for uh, clients worldwide. And you can see uh, how high quality uh, the genome is, measured, of course, in the N50, and the, the ability to see uh, the, the gap percentage. However, this is uh, still very competitive in price and would continue to be so as energy enlarged the uh, portfolio of possible assemblies even further. T touching back on the uh, ASAF uh, as presentation, we can see here examples of uh, the uh, the development or the evolution of the de novo assemblies of options along the time in wheat. So wheat is a specifically uh, very complex uh, uh, genome to assemble. And you can see the outcome that, in, that Energin has been uh, getting in 2015, which was 7 million uh, N50, to 2017 going up to 40 million. And uh, today's we can get 30 million with the Novo Max technology, which is significantly lower price. Comparing that to uh, just using open code from uh, algorithmic uh, uh, development from academics, we can still see that uh, the difference in quality is, is significant. And so we claim that uh, the, for real research with somebody who wants to have several genomes for his specific research question, it's very cost effective to come and require the, the full service. Uh, next, I'm ha very happy to introduce Dr. Khalil Lolas. Khalil is the Agrogenomics Segment Manager of the Americas in Illumina. As I mentioned, Illumina is manufacturing that uh, sequencing machine that we're using for assembly uh, very, uh, in a very many meaningful and is the basis for all the assembly technology we've developed. And uh, Khalil will actually talk about the use of the machine and other uh, activities that Illumina has in the agrogenomic space. Khalil, please take it from here. Thank you very much, Guy. It's a pleasure to be here. I absolutely love to hear about how Energene have been able to innovate through bioinformatics and library prep to be able to get these high quality assemblies at low cost using our technology. And then it's great to hear from Asaf about how that technology is being used to actually answer biologically important questions for those species of interest. So, you know, Illumina's machines are incredibly versatile and they support a breadth of applications across the continuum of research all the way through to the applied use of genomic technologies in agriculture, all the way from discovery in, in de novo references, doing diversity studies through whole genome sequencing, discovering variants, understanding population structure, um, to be able to take all of that together to develop marker sets that they can use for further research at lower cost or to be able to uh, find the trade associations through GWAS studies that are required to, to pull apart the functional biology um, to understand these traits and then to be able to manipulate them through breeding programs and high throughput genotyping applications. And so our sequencing technologies fit very nicely across that front end, and we've just heard some great examples of that in the de novo space, but we support the annotation through RNA sequencing, the functional analysis, the, the high throughput genotyping applications on sequencing from SKIM through Amplicon, uh, genotyping by sequencing applications. And then our array technologies are wonderfully complementary in the way that we can have high density arrays to do those reference populations and trait mapping experiments with hundreds of thousands of SNP markers. And then we have smaller, more high throughput, low cost arrays that can enable those high throughput routine genomic selection and marker assisted selection type approaches in breeding. 
And a lot of this is being driven by that Novasek system, which has an, an unprecedented and absolutely unmatched level of throughput and an unmatched quality as well in terms of next generation sequencing. But up until recently, there was one thing that it couldn't do, and that was to do you know, slightly longer reads of a, a paired end two by 250 base pairs on the Novaseq. It was limited to two by 150 base pairs. But that changed earlier this year when we released the SP flow cell. And that is enabling people to be able to migrate some of these types of projects from the HiSeq rapid run to the Novaseq, where they can take advantage of the higher throughput the lower cost of data that is available on that platform. And, and it's quite stark, actually, when people look at the cost per gig on that system, we can see that it's almost two-thirds or 67% cheaper to get the same volume of data on that SP flow cell on the NovaSeq than it was on the HiSeq. And that's also part of what is driving the, uh, uh, the reduction in cost for applications like these de novo sequencing projects. Um, what is also a challenge with the Novaseq system is just the sheer volume of data that comes out of it. Um, you know, we've been increasing the throughput of sequencing at an, at an incredibly rapid rate, but this has posed new challenges in terms of the bioinformatics and computational processes required to gain insight from that data. And in order to support that, we recently acquired a company called um, the Dra um, Dragon, which was from Etico Genome. Now, this is a, a, a chip system and computational hardware system that is designed specifically for processing genetic sequencing data. Uh, and it's really appropriate for people doing alignments uh, for RNA-seq or whole genome resequencing studies. Um, and it can process data much, much faster than sort of more conventional server systems that they may have access to. And, and this is a benefit because it speeds up research as well as being able to run lots of different analyses to optimize bioinformatic pipelines or just to be able to process very large numbers of samples. And a great example of that is the Earlham Institute, who were an early adopter of this technology. They were also working in wheat, which is a huge challenge given that the genome of wheat is, is five times larger than the human genome. Uh, and they were able to get a 20-fold increase in the capacity and the speed of the way that they were able to do those resequencing experiments. I did also want to give a, a, a quick shout for the Agricultural Greater Good Initiative that Illumina runs for those of you that are working in plants and animals. If you're working in a species that is agriculturally very important for the world's food security or environmental sustainability, and, and you're lacking some of the resources that's required to properly characterize um, the germplasm that's there or to be able to build the tools for ge uh, genomic selection and breeding, um, we do offer one grant a year with 20 terabases of Novaseq data, which is equivalent value of about a quarter of a million dollars. So it's a quite a significant grant. We've been running this for about the last 10 years. And last year's winner, which we announced at PAG, was uh, Elena Stiani from University Bari for the International Camel Consortium work, which we hope will go to supporting a lot of the breeding efforts in the Middle East and North Africa, as well as other parts of the world like South America, where we have some new world camelid species as well. So please, if you've got those kinds of projects, reach out to us. The, the link is there or on our website to be able to apply for that grant. Tell us about the amazing work that you want to do using our technology, and, and we'll absolutely consider those applications. And without further ado, I will pass you over to Alvaro, who is one of the users of our Novaseq technology in collaboration with NRG, to tell you about how that has changed the way that he has offered his service operations at the University of Urbana. So thank you very much. Thank you, Khalil. Um, I am Alvaro Hernandez, and I'm the director of the DNA sequencing facility at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I'm first going to give you an overview of our sequencing facility, and then I will talk about the unique expertise that we bring to the Novo Assembly and how our partnership with Energene and with Illumina has enabled high-quality assemblies of over 100 genomes. Um, our facility is an academic facility, um, but our capabilities are available to other institutions and we routinely partner with other institutions, academic institutions, and private institutions from all over the United States and also from other countries. 
Um, we are a service lab. Our technicians have masters and PhDs, and they are fully dedicated to sample preparation, to library construction, and to sequencing. Um, regarding the equipment that we have, uh, right now we have one Nova 6 6000. Uh, we also have several high 6 uh, 2500 and high 6 4000. But with the release of the new flow cells for the Nova 6 this year, all the high 6 instruments became obsolete. Um, the Nova 6 has a higher output and higher quality, so that really made the, um, the high 6 4000 um, um, completely obsolete. Um, so the Nova 6 is the instrument that is used for all the applications that need high, high depth of sequencing, such as um, de novo genome assembly, genome resequencing, RNA-seq, all the epigenetic applications, such as uh, chip-seq or, or um, uh, methylation, by sulfide conversion, and also RNA-seq, and so on and so forth. Um, the Nova 6 has been very well uh, accepted by users. They see the higher output for a lower cost per gigabase, as well as the higher quality. So there is, we have seen an, an increased demand in the past few months, and we purchased another Nova 6 that will be installed now in, uh, in July. Um, so not everyone needs billions of reads. So for those applications that only need a few millions of sequences, we also have three MySeq. The MySeq are used mostly for um, metagenomics, 16S RNA sequencing, as well as for sequencing of bacteria and viral uh, genomes, and also for targeted sequencing. We also have uh, automatic um, uh, robotic automation for construction of libraries in a high throughput manner. We have two 10x chromium systems. One is used for single cell transcriptomics, and the other one is used for, um, for, long, for production of long linked reads for the novo assembly. We also can produce long reads with the grid ion Oxford nanopore. And um, some of the projects we sequence um, produce files that take many terabytes. And for that, we offer a permanent archive in which you can set up your own password protected folder, and you can keep uh, your files there for at least um, 10 years. So what is that uh, unique expertise that we offer that enables high quality genome assemblies? It's definitely in the way that we construct the libraries. So as Guy explained, the, the basis for the de novo assembly is the PCR free libraries. Because they are PCR free, they do not have the biases associated with, um, with amplification. And there are three things that are critical in these libraries. One. So we made the libraries with very precise uh, fragment lengths. So there is no range in here, for example, 100 to 300 uh, base pairs. We made them with very precise fragment lengths, which helps in the, in the uh, accuracy of the assembly. So they, are, they have a very narrow fragment, uh, range of fragment lengths. The second one is that our libraries allow for very high sequencing depth without the data getting redundant. For example, in the wheat genome, the wheat genome is 16 gigabases. And you need to sequence it to a depth of 60x. That what means that you need one terabase of sequencing from one library. Usually, uh, a shotgun library, after a few gigabases of sequencing, it starts getting redundant. But our libraries can be sequenced to one terabase and to one terabase and still produce uh, novel data. And the other critical thing is that we construct the libraries with unique dual indexes. These unique dual indexes they prevent sequences that come from index switching from getting into the data set. So they filter out any index switching. The same principle are, uh, applies to the made pair libraries. Our libraries have a very precise um, jump uh, length, so you know exactly how, how far apart are the two ends that are sequenced from a DNA fragment. They also allow for high sequencing depth without getting redundant, so we can sequence them on S4 lanes, on the lanes of an S4 flow cell that can produce up to 900 gigabases per lane. And they are also constructed with uh, unique dual indexes. Uh, we also make 10 genomics libraries uh, for scaffolding. These libraries are, done, are uh, constructed with fragments, with DNA fragments of at least 50 KB. This is usually 50 KB up to a megabase uh, uh, of length. And uh, they produce a very nice uh, tool for, for, for long-range long scaffolding. Uh, for our internal process, uh, projects, we also offer long reads uh, with Oxford Nanopore. And also, we offer direct RNA sequencing for annotation not only of the genes of one species, but also for all the splice variants in that species. So uh, the sequencing of the libraries is now done uh, in the NovaSeq. 
and the NOVA seed had a, a transformative effect on the NOVA genome assembly. As an example, um, we used to get around 250 million reads in a, in a per lane in the high seek 2500, and now we get around 1 billion reads per lane in the NOVA 66000 for the same cost. So we are talking about four times the output for the same cost. So this had an immediate effect on making the assemblies more affordable. But as important as, as the cost, what we saw from the beginning was that when we sequence made pair libraries and 10x libraries, these libraries tend to have long fragment sizes, uh, sometimes around uh, 1 KB. Um, those libraries in the high seq 4000, you can see that the, the quality of the read 2 was always compromised. It was always much lower than the quality of read 1. That doesn't happen in the NovaSeq. The NovaSeq is very forgiving of libraries with long fragment sizes. So we see that the quality of read 2 is as, is as perfect as quality of read 1, usually with quality scores around 38 or 40. So that had a, you know, also has a major impact on the quality of, of the assemblies. So what we have here is a perfect example of a partnership between us, uh, an academic facility with expertise in library construction and high quality sequencing and also customer support, and Enagene, a private company with cutting edge knowledge in computational tools for the Novo assembly. And the result of this has been the assembly of hundreds of high quality uh, genomes. With that, I will turn over to Guy for the summary of the presentation, and I will be glad to answer questions in the Q&A session. Thank you, Alvaro, so much. So to summarize and to put everything together, uh, in this webinar, we've seen how the basic technology of 250 by 2 reads on a Novasex 6000 by Illumina, coupled with high-quality library preparation done by Ivaro and his team, is uh, kind of integrated into Energene's technology, and uh, the assembly coming out of this data is actually very high quality and very low cost, even in very high uh, coverage genomes and very large genomes like the wheat that was presented by Asaf. So this is an example of combining all this uh, technologies together really supports uh, breakthrough in science and wheat research that translate into applicable data and results that can support breeding and agriculture application worldwide. Thank you everyone for listening and we will take answer, uh, questions from now on. Great, thank you, Guy, um, and thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, as a reminder to webinar participants, if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. And before we begin the Q&A, we'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to give us feedback by taking our exit survey. All right, we'll now start the Q&A. Um, our first question could be addressed to any of our panelists, so uh, feel free to jump in. Um, we'd like to know if anybody could comment in detail about how the described short read techniques, or even 10x or mate pairs on the NovaSeq 10,000, um, how you think that uh, competes against long read technologies such as PacBio uh, or Nanopore for de novo assembly uh, generation in agri-food? Who'd like to take that one first? Um, so I'll take that one. Um, so we have been uh, doing uh, short reads assemblies for many years now, and we're constantly monitoring uh, the advancement of long read technology and comparing what can be done on the assembly side uh, with long reads. And I can say specifically for the De Novo Max application that we have tried to uh, add on uh, low low coverage uh, pack bio information and actually there is uh, marginal advancement to doing that and if customers uh, for example wish to improve contiguity uh, for uh, for their specific use case with pack bio data that's certainly possible however as you've seen there is no need for long reach technology for the bulk of the you know bulk of the work in the assembly. So you can get to very high, nice uh, N50 of scaffold without long reads, and that's very important considering cost effective of creating many genomes 
versus creating one very good uh, single genome. So re depending on the application, it's sometimes better to have a larger number of genome and then maybe give some of the contiguity away while uh, investing the money in other things. Uh, other questions? Would anyone like to follow up? Anyone care to follow up on that? All right, moving on. Um, Asaf, uh, just to add to that, have you ever um, tried using the PB Jelly pipeline to align long sequencing reads? So I think it is actually uh, to us. I'm not sure uh, this is to Asaf because Asaf was basically using the genome and using his own uh, methods to uh, align things to the final genome. I think it's more about us, uh, about uh, the, the way that we do the uh, the alignment, and I can say we haven't tried that. So not with the PBG, PBG bit jelly specifically. Okay. Um, and uh, how fast is fast delivery? Okay, so uh, that's the million dollar question. Uh, usually we commit to four months from the time data is actually available. Uh, thanks to Alvaro's great service, it's usually uh, much shorter than that, and actually uh, we can uh, accomplish uh, a, a shorter time frame, but we can commit to actually deliver the even the more, most complex uh, homozygote genomes in that uh, uh, that period of time, which I think is definitely, you know, something that is worthwhile considering if you're doing your uh, research. Other projects, you know, have, we've heard are work uh, uh, taking much, much longer. All right. Um, could anyone comment on how compatible short reads are to long reads using Oxford Nanopore technology? Alvaro, when, maybe you want to take that one? Yes, yeah, so we mostly use Oxford Nanopore for um, small genomes, so for bacterial genomes, for yeast, for fungi, and some uh, eukaryotic uh, small genomes, like in insects. And, um, and with, you know, Oxford Nanopore is an evolving technology. Um, they, every two or three months, they come up with new, with new base colors, with new flow cells, with new capabilities that are increasing the, um, the, the, um, the, um, the, the error rate, they are decreasing the error rate, let's say increasing the accuracy. Um, for small genomes, we see it working well. For large genomes, I think um, uh, still um, the computational part of it is, um, is a bottleneck. Um, it takes an enormous amount of time to do um, assemblies of, of large genomes. So um, I would say that that's, that's our experience. For, for bacterial genomes, we definitely go to Oxford Nanopore. Still, it has a, you know, a 5 to 10% error rate, so it has to be corrected. All the assemblies must be corrected with Illumina to correct all the small insertions and deletions that they have. But um, in, in large genomes, we have seen that the bottleneck um, becomes the bioinformatics, and that's the, the, the advantage of any gene, that even for massive genomes such as, um, such as wheat, they can do it in, in a few weeks to, to maybe one or two months. Um, and Alvaro, how long is the overlap between reads one and two when you fuse your two by 250 fragments? Yes, yeah, so um, what, that also guy can, can answer that, but basically um, it's anywhere from 10 to, to about um, 40 base pairs. That's what we aim to in the, in the libraries. Guy, do you want to add anything? No, it, that, that's actually very correct. So it's about 40 bases uh, with uh, you know, the distribution, but the uh, bulk of the distribution is around 40. Okay, great. Um, Alvaro, I think this might be uh, for you. If you're interested in discovering SNPs, if someone is interested in discovering SNPs, uh, what library preparation approach um, would you recommend for a genome with 80% repeated sequences? Or perhaps, Asaf, you might be interested in answering this one. Or even Guy would be, I think, um, 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 a good person to answer that. I think um, for SNPs, uh, if there is a good reference genome, I would definitely do um, shotgun libraries. And um, probably overlapping, um, the overlapping uh, PCR-free libraries would be a good one to, to do. Um, but if you have a lot of samples, then libraries with a little bit of, um, um, of uh, PCR amplification would make it um, uh, easier to, to do multiplexing of libraries. But I think, uh, in my opinion, would be um, a shotgun libraries if there is a good reference genome. I agree. 
And I think uh, one of our uh, downstream application actually does like a mini assembly of the uh, the reads that you're actually uh, correlating with the reference genome. So when you're actually um, comparing contexts with the reference genome, you actually get uh, much higher resolution and accuracy when the genome is, uh, you know, high repetitive content. And so this is one of the options that high quality genomes allow you to do is basically now you can uh, compare uh, to high quality genomes or compare context to, to a high quality genome overcoming this problem of short reads. And if I can um, also go, comment there, oh, just yeah. in terms of the actual library prep kits that are available for those types of applications, uh, if it's the PCR-free approach that Alvaro mentioned, that's a, we have the, the TrueSeq PCR-free library kit, prep kit. If it's with some PCR, in order to be able to use less material um, or to have a slightly easier workflow, there is the TrueSeq Nano DNA kit. Um, or the fastest and easiest of them all is now the next Terra Flex library prep from Illumina, uh, which has the lowest uh, levels of input um, and is a perfectly appropriate uh, tool to be able to do SNP discovery and uh, diversity applications. So there's lots of good options. Great. Um, Alvar, we have a, a follow-up question to your previous answer about Oxford Nanopore. When you say large genomes, uh, what size are you talking about with regards to Oxford Nanopore? Yeah, so today we feel comfortable maybe assembling a genome up to 300 megabases. More than that, with the grid ion, it gets um, really expensive. You need um, a lot of libraries, you need a lot of DNA, and, um, and several flow cells. So that's, that's what I mean. Anything over 300 megabases, uh, I would say I refer people to Energin because um, that's where they can shine. And um, maybe Oxford Nanopore has some new, you know, um, uh, applications there, like, like for example, the Prometheon that has a higher throughput. But with the grid ion, anything over, um, anything over 300 megabases just gets too expensive. Okay, great. Um, Guy, um, can can data that's been previously collected, uh, next generation sequencing data that's been previously collected for whole genome sequencing projects, uh, can that be reanalyzed by Energene? And if so, um, what would be the primary benefit of doing that? Uh, so there's a big difference between reanalyzed and reassembled. <clears throat> so right now, for an actual de novo assembly, we need that specific set of libraries and coverages I indicated in my slides. However, uh, when you want to compare uh, previously collected information to uh, a newly created assembly, that's uh, where you can actually use your data. So uh, we actually come across this situation quite often when people want to compare diversity. They have uh, uh, partial coverage of some of the uh, diversity, but they don't have any good reference to work with. So our recommendation in this case is pick one of the, your major line assemble it to high quality, and then we can uh, very, ha very efficiently and uh, very accurately compare the rest of the diversity represented here by the, uh, I would say, legacy data to this newly created uh, genome that was just assembled. And Guy, why is the de novo max focused on homozygote genomes? Um, and as a follow-up on that, what would be an effective approach for heterozygote genomes, for example, 10% heterozygous or more? Um, so this is exactly uh, the, the difference between the de novo magic application and de novo max. So uh, this reduction in libraries and coverages has a much more a stronger effect when dealing with heterozygote genomes. Okay, so uh, the de novo magic is the perfect application to analyze heterozygote genomes, as we've shown in several uh, papers that uh, we were part of. Uh, we've done an octoploid heterozygote zygote and a tetraploid heterozygote and the phasing worked really nice but it does require all the original libraries and a higher coverage. Uh, when you move to homozygotes, uh, the, the problem is simpler. You don't need any phasing, and then you can reduce cover and use less of the libraries. Uh, and then, again, it depends on the level of heterozygosity that you have and the application. So if you don't care about losing some of the heterozygote information, in this case, maybe 10% is not that uh, much of a difference, then you can go to uh, uh, you, 
considering your genome a homozygote and assembling it as a, as a max, uh, as a de novo max uh, project rather than a de novo magic project. Great. Um, so our next question, can optical mapping be a useful complement to short reads for assembly? Uh, yes, actually, uh, it was used in some of the uh, projects. Uh, actually, in some of the wheat project, we uh, used optical ma map mapping to arrange the scaffolds uh, into chromosomes and so on. Uh, but again, it's not a replacement. It's uh, something that helps you once you have long and high quality scaffold. You can use the optical mapping to arrange those. It's very difficult to use uh, optical mapping on sh short uh, scaffolds or just quantig level and you know in that case the optical mapping will be just a lot of resources spent for a very little uh, value great and guy um, do the de novo max prices uh, as presented currently include gene annotation of the genome scaffolds uh, no, they don't. Uh, for gene annotation, we're actually having a following uh, product called uh, the, the no, well, it's pan genome uh, kind of approach. Uh, in a pan genome, we actually compare several uh, fully assembled genome one to the other, and then we annotate them all. So the annotation not only includes an annotation of a single genome, but also the comparison of the gene space between the different genomes. Okay, so annotating a single genome has been done many times by different applications in the academics, and you can actually find uh, open source uh, methods to do, th do so. Annotating a pan genome is something unique that Energene is actually selling as a service. Great, thank you. Um, Asaf, uh, did you use any uh, information, any additional information during the assembly process uh, that you didn't uh, specify in your presentation? Uh, yes, for the final assembly, we used the HiC data, and this uh, this helped us to uh, arrange the large scaffolds across the the chromosome and to create a pseudo molecule, which is the uh, like the image of the chromosome. Uh, later on, and this is the an answer for the previous question, we used optical uh, mapping data. And this, again, it helped us to arrange the already uh, sequenced scaffold uh, uh, along the chromosome. Great, thank you. Uh, Khalil, a question for you. Um, can you tell us when the Rib Zero kit for uh, Biolumina will be available for plants? Uh, the Rib Zero kit, I can't, but um, if someone wants to reach out to me separately from that, um, my email is just K-L-A-W-L-E-S-S -S at um, I'll be happy to follow up on that question uh, after the fact. Great, thank you. Um, Alvaro, does the NovaSeq have a higher duplicate rate than the HiSeq 2500 and 4000? Um, it does. But um, so it basically, it's, it's always um, a balance between um, yield and duplicate rate. So what we have to do is we have to find a sweet spot at which we have the highest yield and the lowest um, duplicate rate. So if you load a um, low amount of libraries, you will have a very high um, duplicate rate. If you load a very high amount of library, you will have a low pass filter. So you have to find a balance in which you have the, the highest possible yield the highest possible pass filter, and the lowest possible and duplicate rate. And, um, and that differs for every library, for every, depending on the fragment size of the library, depending on whether it's a PCR library or, or a, or a PCR-free library. Um, but that's, that's something that comes with a little bit of experience, and uh, Illumina has helped us uh, uh, quite a bit in, in getting to that sweet spot. Asaf, a question for you. Um, have you tested the quality of the Novomax assemblies in regions other than BTR1? That would be a question for, for Guy. Um, yes, actually, uh, I will answer it. Uh, we, di we did uh, test uh, other regions, too. And we also compared it to optical mapping data. And uh, the results is very satisfying. Uh, 
In some cases where you have high uh, complexity, repetitive DNA, you will get less quality. But the important thing is that uh, continuity is preserved. And this enables you, like in, the, in, in a case that I showed before, to capture a whole QTL region in uh, one or two scaffolds, and that way to identify the, the genes and mutations that can be under this QTL region. Guy, if I wanted to compare between several genomes, could I do that with both Genova Max and Genova Magic? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, if I wanted to compare between several genomes, could I do that with both Genova Max and Genova Magic? Yes, you can. Uh, the, uh, the, the important thing is to have uh, the uh, the high quality assemblies. You can even compare to to genomes that have not been done by Energen. It's just a matter of uh, them being high quality enough. And so Energen is actually ex uh, ex having expertise in assembling very complex genomes. So if you're talking about wheat uh, comparison, then you just need to have enough high quality genomes to compare. If you're talking about rice, for example, we would be able to also include high quality uh, genomes assemblies from other partners. Great, thank you. Um, Alvaro, uh, do you use any instruments from Sage Science at the Roy J. Carver Biotechnology Center? Uh, from Sage, we use the blue peeping. Um, mostly for the um, size selection of libraries for, um, for the Tenex genomics. Great, thank you. And Alvaro, does your core work with researchers from other institutions or with private companies? Yes, we work with both. So we um, work with um, um, academic and private institutions from all over the United States and from many other countries. Uh, we are used to signing non-disclosure non agreements. To, to, you know, we adapt to, to, to the needs of any um, user that wants to, to take advantage of our uh, capabilities. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're running out of time, so we're going to wrap it up there. We'd like to thank Asaf Distelfeld, Guy Cole, Khalil Lawless, Alvaro Hernandez, and our sponsors, Illumina and Energene. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this Genome Webinar.